Yo, 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 what's up, what's up, what's up? Welcome back to Let's Chop It Up, another great week. How are my brothers doing? You what's already up, know. We good, we good, we good. How was your week, good. Rod? Anything exciting, brother? Anything? Uh, you know what? I didn't have much to say, uh, much exciting to say about this week. Um, just spent time with family as much as possible. Um, just always trying to stay positive, trying to release positivity in the world, you know, and um, and, and it was pretty much a slow motion week. Not much to be said. Just, you know, enjoying my time with you guys right now, though, man. This is the highlight of my week. You know? How about you, Rodney? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, nothing, nothing much exciting. I mean, I got a lot of things done. It was, it was a little bit of productive week for me, as far as business wise. But everything is good. Um, my son decided to pop up and um, surprise everybody, and he popped up and came home for the weekend. So he's here now. So we're gonna get a good meal because he's upstairs cooking. So yeah, but other no, than that, everything else good. Cool. How was how was your week, Kelvin? Everything was great, man. I'm. I, you know how you move to new levels in life. Mm-hmm. You know, and once you you can't move to the next level until you master one level. So I have mastered not having money. I've completed it. I have mastered <laughs> mastered being broke. I've done that. So now I think the the arrow's pointing up. Also, I'm extremely <laughs> excited about coming to America. I haven't been to Zamunda since '88, and now it's time <laughs> to go back. So I'm ready. But uh, D, I'm excited about tonight's show, and I'm excited about life. It'll be it'll, Wakanda and, um, um, and what's the place again? Zamunda. Zamunda. Zamunda, Zamunda had, a, had a beef. That would be kind of ill. But I was, yeah, I was, yeah, neighboring <laughs> city. That would have been, been hot. That would have been hot. <laughs> now, but my, my week was my week was cool. It was interesting. It was fun. It went by fast. I did something different, guys. I didn't even tell you about this on Wednesday, man. brother. I got my chest waxed. Whoa! Oh! <laughs> Whoa! You ever hear it? Why? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so listen. I went to this company, Wango Priestley. They they also do uh, waxing now too. Besides head wraps, they try to do some wax and stuff. So I got my chest waxed this weekend. Oh! Right. Yeah, my yeah. BDBs were getting too strong. Oh, all right. All right. Was, was, that, was that your idea? Kind of, kind of. It was getting hey, too crazy, hey, you're man. Killing me here, you killing nah, nah, me it, here, brother. It coming out my neck. It was getting kind of crazy. Man. Oh man, you gotta take it. You know, my beard. I had to shave down last week. I get, no self care like, is important, man. Yeah, yeah man. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, shout yeah. out to TT's uh, Butter Company, man. I got that. Um, I, I ordered something. I came. I got that uh, sweet and salt scrub. Uh, <laughs> Whoa, that's that stuff is intoxicating. I'm ready. Oh yeah, Uh-oh. you're ready. <laughs> it's Uh-oh. beautiful. Uh-oh. It's beautiful. I'm ready. Yo, for for the audience that doesn't know what we're talking about, um, TT's has this really great um, sugar scrub that she sells, yeah. and the smell on a woman is amazing when they after they use it. So it, it it's kind of arousing, like you know, like when my wife puts it on. I mean, you know, it, it yeah, it um kind of sets it off. Yeah, my wife and I did a we did a little unboxing, man. You know what I mean? It came in a nice box. It was well prepared. It was nice. Nicely put together, man. It was very yeah. professional. That's what's up. When you open it, you just instantly smell it, man. Yeah, it, yeah, well, yeah. Well, I'm, well, I'm gonna put I'm gonna put some of that on my chest. But um, <laughs> but in 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 uh, weekly news, we have uh, we seen over five hundred thousand coronavirus deaths. Uh, we surpassed that this week. So I mean, what's your brother's thoughts on that? And over the last, well, it almost, almost will be a year next month that we really started tackling this thing. Yeah, wow. yeah. We lost you, a lot you of know, people to well, COVID. We remember, you remember when initially, um, when Trump said, if we lose 200,000 people, we'll, we'll be fortunate. And people was like, that's ridiculous. And I mean, the, the comment was so dismissive and it just felt disrespectful. And now looking back, man, I mean, to lose 500,000 people is just tragic. I mean, to lose one person is tragic. But I would have never thought in a, in a million years to have something killed half a million people in in this way you know so it's it, it's tough man it, it, my heart goes out um to all of the families and just every associate you know we all know somebody who knows yeah. somebody who passed yeah so, yeah, yeah. It's just tough you know yeah it, it's just i wonder so, if, so, i wonder if oh. he was being back to the trump thing i don't want to get on the trump thing but i'm wondering if now man if he was um being dismissive of if he was just being prescient man because you know it was kind of like getting us ready for it because who knew five hundred thousand? With him, I think it's dismissive. I, yeah, I mean, well, of the, course. The, the, the tiebreaker goes. The, yeah, the, he don't care about nobody. But I think, yeah, but I, but I think you can be both. You know what I mean? That's just like you know, it was it was kind of predictive as well. You know what I mean? When you look at it, because look at where we are. You know what I mean? And and you know, I don't know. It's, 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 well, you know what it is, Derek, and I I agree with you. The only thing is when you say if 
we uh, lose two hundred thousand people. I think we did a good job. The question is, who are those people? Yeah, like, yeah. like if it, if it's if it's your cousin or son or somebody yeah. like that, then it's like you know, yeah. you know, who, how do you choose that? So that's it. Just seemed like it minimized life. You know what I mean? But he probably was right. Just I, what I learned a long time ago is just because something is right doesn't mean it needs to be said. Some things are better off left unspoken, and I think that may have been the way it was phrased. Would have been one of those things. Yeah, and like yeah. Lisa said, that's only five hundred thousand deaths in the United States. Yeah, right. just the United States. <laughs> that's the United States. I think the total right. total total cases is what twenty eight and a half million. Wow. Of cases of COVID, we have. Wow. Yeah. wow. And, and just the United States, just the United wow. States. Yeah, and then um, and then and some little lighter note, but still COVID related. We had. Uh, did you guys see the the the? Ladies and pastor and the grandmas, uh, so they can get in front of the line. They get the COVID vaccine shot first. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They came okay. in there looking like they came in there looking like the Golden Girls. They should have <laughs> gave them. They should have gave them a shot that that would have gave them diarrhea. The diarrhea for the last six months. That's what they should have gave them when they found out who they were. Can you imagine? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. That was just. That, that, I mean, come on, right. you know what I'm saying? Like it, it's it's just like there's there's people that need that shot a lot more than other people, right. and mm-hmm. people are taking advantage. But you know, and I. And I, I kind of feel like there's probably, you know, there could be probably doctors out there cutting lines for people for extra pay too, you know, because they oh. there was a couple of a couple of Beverly Hills doctors that said they were offered extra money to give certain people the, the COVID vaccine, you know. So definitely, if people see opportunity, they're going to take it. Yeah. Now, 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 what I did hear was um, I heard somebody here uh, in the New York area say that some of the places, rather than let it expire. I guess after um, th- there's an expiration regarding um, refrigeration. And so some people at the end of whatever day that is or cycle, rather than them throw it out, they make it available to anybody who's in close proximity. So one yeah. person that was young said they were able to get the shot because they just hung around and they rather than throw it out, they got it. So people would be wait, you know, be willing to wait like that. To me, at the end of the day, you, you trying to get that shot illegally is, is taking it away from somebody more deserving at the moment. And I think that's what's really upsetting to them. And I mean, they got a slap on the wrist to me. I thought there should have been, um, you know, kind of a precedent set with them. They just sent them away and told them they're blocked out from getting it their regular time, I think. Yeah. yeah and it's, yeah. But it just shows you, like, you know, and it, it, like I said, in my neighborhood, in the August Morning High School, the first, when they started opening up, it was nothing but white people. None of them mm-hmm. live in my neighborhood. So it's like, you know, it's still, we still seeing that across the board. I mean, Jamie lives in Tampa. Jamie was telling us about before, like in, in the hardest neighborhoods before with uh, people, of, with people of color living in, you have white people coming in there getting this access before us. And they were well, how, how is that? Is, is, is it representative of the neighborhood or it has nothing to do with the neighborhood, the actual center? What, the, the, what are you giving the shots at? So, so yeah, in your neighborhood, August Martin is in a, a predominantly black neighborhood. Yeah. You're saying that Correct. the line is predominantly white people receiving the shot. It, well, just how started, did, it just started changing to a mixed crowd. Okay, well, how did that? How did they determine that? Is it just that these people could be from, you know, Bensonhurst and they're sent there, or, or are when, they taking it from I, somebody I, who's... I think when they first sent it out, they, they didn't give, like, for zip code. Now, I think with the new one, with, I just got for, the co- uh, for York College and you got Mega Evans College, they're going by zip code and you have to have proof. But before that, it seemed like they, because they have access. Remember, some of our neighbors, and we, gonna, we could probably, when we talk to our guests about this, some of our, and our neighbors don't have internet ac- access. They don't have young people to know how to work it out. Then also when they call on the phone, the phone lines are always jammed up. Mm-hmm. So so certain people have better access to certain technology that they was able to get on board first and then get in the lines first before all of us in our neighbors. The people that are dying more of us on the front lines doing health healthcare services, uh, you know, public transportation, police department, fire department, all the EMS. So and it, it just it it really goes to show you like we still have discrepancies in and I mean you know um, uh, racism and when it comes even they have just getting the dog on shot and it's really yeah. it's really sad. Mm-hmm. You know, well, racism, um, racism and or prejudices don't take a break mm-hmm. during the pandemic. I mean, it's just, <laughs> you know, it's, like, it's still set the stage. But you know, I, at the end of the day, I'll say that there's certain things I would be very very afraid to do and um this is something you don't play with so yeah. i just hope people can find some civility to make sure that you know it's kind of like just an orderly fashion thing you know we we gotten this far to just just please everybody you know stay the yeah. course yeah, yeah yeah so now um, and another and, uh one thing that uh, with recent times uh, i hope we don't have another uh george floyd situation come to the u.s and um you know how we did last year in the summertime but 
there's it was a no knock warrant issued in Kentucky where a young man lost his life again to police to the, the hands of police. Any thoughts on no knock warrants? And I want to start this question. I want to lead off with this question, giving it to Rod because you're the one that have the years in law enforcement. How do you feel, my brother, about no 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 knock warrants? Well, the thing is, um, I'm, I'm well. I'm going to explain what I don't know if people, everybody knows what a no knock warrant is. A no knock warrant is basically you basically go to the uh, the courts and you get a search warrant where you're allowed to execute that search warrant between a certain amount of hours. Right. Most likely it's early in the morning where people are asleep and you don't have to knock or announce yourself as the police before you hit that door. All right. So the thing is, the no knock warrant is used for the element of surprise. They don't want people to see them coming or whatever. Yes, I have done no knock warrants myself. I mean, I've never had any in incidents where anything has gone wrong. It's definitely based on how much resource research that those officers have done on that place sometimes the officers are not they don't do their due diligence and sometimes they hit the wrong place the wrong house or the wrong apartment you know what I'm saying and that's when no knock warrants become a bad thing because they're not doing their due diligence to make sure that they got the right right apartment the right house the right location those are the most of the time that no knock warrants go wrong but i do feel in law enforcement that they need some sort of element of surprise when dealing with criminals. You don't want to not let people know you're coming because, you know, things can turn very ugly very quickly. But um, in this situation, I'm not a completely educated about what happened with this situation. I think they're still looking into it, but pretty much that's how I see no knock warrants. They, they, they're they just based on the element of surprise. That's all. So, so my thing is like, this This is my whole thing with the police. I and mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong. You already noticed mm -hmm. This person is supposed to be at this address, right? Say you have one, two, three Jefferson Street, and mm -hmm. you know he's going to be there. This is where you already have the information. Now, when you're surround the house already, have a helicopter out the can, and why do you well, have to no knock and knock and and, and just and well, the thing is, actually, it's supposed to be. That's why I tell you about the due diligence of the officers. Technically, before you do a search warrant on location, it's supposed to be set on and watched. That's how they do it in New York. Like that location has been watched the night, since the night before you're going to hit it mm -hmm. to make sure. How, and you're supposed to take notes on how many people are going in and out of the location, how many people are in there before the warrant was executed and how many people left or what have you. So, like I said, sometimes not all the time the officers do what they're supposed to do. And that's how sometimes these mistakes happen. I think. But, um, go, go ahead. No, I th I, and, I, and I was just wondering, I, you, you can tell me if, if I'm wrong, as I recall, like. I think no no knock warrants were originally for like let's say active shooter or something where someone's life was in danger originally when they were put together, you know, and um and I think it kind of turned into something else where it just became okay almost like all right there's, there's drug activity going on in the home and you know or in a place and then we'll, we'll enter off on that you know and um so I I don't I don't know if, I, I, as I understand it's that but but what's 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 troubling about Kentucky is they also have, I, I believe, they're a stand-your-ground state as well, you know? So let's say they're well, like I don't Florida. know if Kentucky's a stand-your-ground state. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I think Florida I heard that they were, but yeah, no, I don't know Florida they, is, but I the think The execution Kentucky of no-knock. Yeah. Oh, I, didn't, yeah, I don't know if Kentucky is, but I know that Florida okay. is definitely a stand-your-ground law. But the thing is, um, no, no-knock warrants are executed to basically get inside a premise that has drugs, guns, some sort of illegal activity going on. That's what no knock warrants were pretty much for. Pretty much anything with active shooters, that's basically, you don't need a warrant for that. Then you go in and you, you gotta do what you gotta do. Okay. But um, mostly, not n most nine, nine times out of 10, they get information from somebody that has been inside the location, as people say, a snitch. And basically they go back to the police, tell that this, this stuff is in there or they've seen it and then they execute the warrant. And that's right. basically what it is. And like I said, no knock warrant is because they don't want to know. They don't want to broadcast that they are coming. So that's the element of surprise by not knocking and hit that door. Gotcha. Gotcha. Right. So in other, in other news, our brother uh, Jay-Z, billionaire Jay-Z, has struck a new uh, a liquor deal with uh, Hennessy. I think is it Hennessy bought into his um into it into it um into this deal, I believe, something like that. A couple of a couple of M's, uh, you know, so. What do you think about that, guys? Uh, Jay Z teaming up with Hennessy. 
more money, more money, more money. More man. money. Yeah, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean <laughs> from them, aren't they? Isn't he? So it's like you got. I mean, like, he had, I, I think he bought. I think he had. He had the, the the company himself, and I think what happened was he wound up with distribution from them. So now he's got that national, that worldwide distribution, mm -hmm. man. So he's about yeah. to get. Mm -hmm. like, that that that's the hardest thing is for you to get a distributor. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I think I think Jay Z and um Dame Dash owned the liquor before, but they couldn't distribute yeah. it. Yeah, they, you know I think it was He's only sold like in forty yeah. forty club. But you know the distribution deal is everything. If you can't get that that um that liquor all over the all over the place, I mean you can't make a lot of money. So I mean Hennessy, you know how we always talk about Hennessy. You can't lose with Hennessy. No, <laughs> can't lose it all. <laughs> I, I think you know what I, I I think what they're doing is giving a good model to um you know you think about Jay Z and Beyonce um both of them I think are just high school graduates um hardworking people uh, have been showing people uh different ways to leverage their success and popularity and making excellent business moves and I think it's I think it's phenomenal that they're able to do that and I think they're making such uh, wonderful steps that it's inspiring other people. Uh, one thing, which is on a side note, that I'm a little surprised. I'm a little surprised that they're allowing their daughter um, to be as exposed as she is. That I'm, I'm surprised that she's already she's already in the industry. She's already an entertainer herself, and I just I'm, I'm a little surprised by that. I thought they would guard her a little better than that because um, when it comes to your childhood, obviously you can't turn that back. But you look at their children; their children are going to be managing an empire one day, and um, I just yeah. think it's a, it's a it's a phenomenal story from where they came from and where they are now. So, you yeah. know, kudos yeah. to them. I th I think I think like you know, as as we all know, Beyonce, Jay Z are brand themselves, and they're and right. most likely they're probably going to do the same thing with their kids. Where pretty much once they create you as a brand, then you can sell anything. You know, yeah. 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 so because yeah, you you can be. So now basically they're brand themselves. He buys into a liquor company, and he can market this liquor himself just taking photos with it putting in videos commercials it's whatever record, yeah so. it's that's yeah. it's, it's gonna blow that's what everybody's doing now they're tying they're tying um entertainers to liquor brands and they're and they're blowing as a result of it so yeah, i no, think no, that's no, gonna no, be no different price always sells so, man yeah so yeah. so uh what's about to come um america's governor uh brother <laughs> i want to ask you guys a question how you feel about a man Cuomo right now, governor of New York, Andrew Cuomo right now. What are you? What are your thoughts? It's, 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 lately, it's, lately, it's looking kind of shady for him. Like he messed up the is. thing with the nursing homes. They saying he's been touching a little booty, maybe a little look here and there. So, what are you guys thoughts? <laughs> all right, let me. All right, so so this is the thing. It's I looking mean, crazy. <laughs> when it comes to, first of all, you know, I think it was a bad optic to write the book about managing the pandemic while the pandemic is still going. Yeah, I think that just seemed a little self serving, and I think that may have kind of. Uh, drew a lot of negative attention. And ultimately, like you just said, once you take on that moniker of America's governor, much like Giuliani took it on as America's mayor, um, I just think it, it gives you a lot more scrutiny and a lot more eyes. As far as him being accused of um, inappropriate uh, sexual misconduct, I, I think we we still have to give people, um, we still have to kind of take a wait and see approach. There should be some due process but I will say this just from the outside, it is starting to look really, really bad. I mean, I don't know, you know, some people say where there's smoke, there's fire. I can just tell you it's starting to get warm. It's starting to heat up, you know, and so, Eyes um, burning. yeah, it's, it's looking bad. So yeah. I would hope, because remember, this was a person that initially we thought had his sight set on the White House. And uh, the, the, mm. the Republicans are definitely, they're looking for this fall. And I'll be honest with you, they're saying a lot of Democrats are not backing him either. So a lot of people are saying, that yeah, they're yeah, they're the pulling I way. think that was the play. Yeah. I think that was it politically, man. I, I don't like to get into conspiracy theories and all that, but you know, it, it, I think there are pretty plenty of people who are rather gleeful about, you know, his, um, his, you know, the debt being put in his, in his image right now, both on both sides of the aisle, actually, you know, well, if you get people ammunition, they're going to use it. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah. And that's yeah, politics. Yeah, sure. That is politics. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, um, it's, I think he reason he wrote the book at that time, though, Kelvin, not to say it was the right time, but because his approval ratings were so high at the time. Yeah, makes sense. That's why he wrote the that's why he wrote the book at that time. You know, and you know how all this thing came out because um, Letitia James came out with her numbers and they didn't match his numbers. That's right, how right. That's and how this thing something. got rolling. Letitia you know? James does not play. 
I mean, she does no, not no. play. She has been working her way up. Now, I'll say this just for anybody out there that's listening, out of being respectful. Um, for instance, now all the all the stuff that you see about Beyonce and stuff like that, you have never ever seen anything regarding she and I quote in our relationship. <laughs> never, never, because I'm saying just as a man, I want to have that type of respect. So I always try to keep that out the press. And we both did it. True, y'all never saw anything with us, right? So that's what I'm saying. See how that no, is. we didn't see how... anything at all with you guys. Thanks. Thank you. And that's the compliment. That's the compliment to me. So there are times TMZ wanted me to, you know, spill the tea, but I wasn't gonna do that. But I'm sorry. Yeah, I got yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're a respectful guy, Kelvin. You know, you're not gonna. Yeah, you're not gonna. I was, I was raised right. You know. I know. I know. I know. I know. The guy's a class act. He's not gonna kiss you, brother. Time, you know what I'm saying? That's what I'm talking yeah. about. I'm just talking about yeah. Shad. So let me. <laughs> so like, I want to talk about a little sports. You know, we brothers, and it's like a barbershop talk. Like, you know, it's talks. I think Kyrie Irving came out and said it looked um, changing the logo of the NBA to Kobe Bryant as the logo, and he said because black kings have built this industry, this, and built the NBA, which I, I I totally agree with him on that. What are you guys' thoughts on Kobe Bryant becoming the logo of the NBA? I don't agree. I don't agree. I um I do agree. Um, I, I recognize the contributions that that African Americans have made to the league, but if anybody were going to get it, obviously you can't do the Jordan uh, logo, who made the game international. But you have to think about Bird and Magic, and if anybody, to me, the greatest Laker ever is Magic Johnson, in my estimation. And I would not give it to Kobe simply because he died. I don't think it's a. I don't think the logo is based on um, a memorial. You know what I mean? And so as a result, uh, Kobe did a lot of great things. Kobe was an exceptional talent. But when I say this, I don't want to hear from Snoop Dogg. I don't want nobody to try to come at me. I'm just saying I do think that um, if anybody and, – and Jerry West is open to somebody changing it. You know, Jerry West uh, yeah. went to nine finals and won one, um, was the MVP once, um, even on a losing team in the finals. He's a tremendous, tremendous uh, – Jerry Rice is – I mean, um, Jerry West is, is executive, as good as an executive as he was player. But I do think if anybody, I would give it to Magic. Well, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. I mean, Magic to me, and I, and I love Magic, but um, m- much of his fame and much of his mystique was so tied to Larry Bird. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, I don't think that I think Kobe uh, gets a lot of credit for yes, for playing he for being the man after Jordan. He kind of carried it, like Jordan set the stage, and then. Kobe kind of, and I can make the argument that Kobe kind of carried it, you know what I mean, onward. You know what I mean? He just took it and and not that he, I mean you can't necessarily get higher than that, but he definitely was a good steward of um, you know, of of being the face of the NBA. And he also gets a lot of credit for taking it international. He was a huge in China, you know what I mean? And you have to look at it in those terms as well. So I mean, I get what you're saying with regard to, to Jerry West, and maybe it is time. Or maybe we can kind of consider changing it around. Um, I wish Kyrie kind of had, and, and not that I'm saying he isn't wrong, but I wish he kind of hadn't said it the way he said it. You know what I mean? Because there are going to be certain people who are going to take offense to that. And I don't know, those people buy tickets too. <laughs> you know, as well, that's, the brand. that's the Kyrie yeah. brand. That's the Kyrie brand. Yeah, if, I understand. If there's a way to say he, something wrong, he's mad. And yeah, and, he, and that's his brand, but I don't necessarily think that, you know. I, I, I don't think he said anything, anything wrong. wrong. No, no, listen. <laughs> be, I think listen. You call it a spade a spade. Right. Actually, listen, you can <laughs> listen. Being right and saying the thing, you know, or you know, it's two different things. You know what I mean? So I'm not see, arguing whether or not. See, you know, see, I think the issue is, I think the issue is what, and I think if if I'm not wrong, I think what Derek is saying is once you bring the racial element in, because you can actually make a case for this. Without bringing without the racial element racial into thing. it, yeah. you can actually make a case. So once you do that, then you automatically have some people saying you just want to do it because he's black and because he died. Whereas if you're just like, I think he was such a great player, then but because now the race thing becomes part of the story, and it takes over the story. It does. Yeah. So so some people, some detractors, with that whether it's right or wrong, yeah, you still have it. No, no, I I, I agree. I agree with what you're saying, Kelvin, about um. You know whether Kobe Bryant should be the the new logo or whatever, but I definitely I do agree that it should be changed. I mean, don't get me wrong, Jerry West was back in his time there he was a great player, but there are so many players now that have achieved so much more than Jerry West. You know what I'm saying? And I think the logo should reflect the dynamics of the the league. You know what I'm saying? The thing is, Jerry West was like what what year was that? Like that was like in the 60s, right? 
Yeah. It was a while back. Yeah, a while back. So, I mean, like, there's so many, there's too many other players that, like I said, achieve Jerry, to achieve, achieve more than Jerry West. And I, I do, I do think it should be changed. I think it should reflect, reflect and, and, the league. And, and the reason why I say you can talk about race, because we're talking about the NBA. NBA are all the sports with first on always addressing the racial issue. Correct. So we got to, and we got to, like, it's the, it's the elephant in the room. Yeah. So you got to talk about those kind of things. We got to look at talk about ownership in, the, in, in well, how many owners are black in the, in the NBA, right? You get those kind of things. You look at managerial issues, like it's going on. Even when you got coaches, the change in the guard when it's like, Mark, why Mark Jackson don't have a job? Well, look, you know, like, like, you know, like, like <laughs> but would you give it to Bill Russell over Kobe? What no, I'm saying is, no, no, no why? No, why? why? Because NBA, when Bill Russell was playing, was still on tape delay. Magic Johnson, I can see your argument because when Magic and Larry was going at it, they started right. playing the games live. Well, Jordan made it, they Larry, they started making Golden Games more live. Yeah, Bill yeah. Russell, they couldn't get his mama to watch the game. On now, TV. do you and do nobody this? saw him play? <laughs> nobody saw right. him play, man. But yeah. do you do this if Kobe Bryant's alive right now? Yeah, I think you still could say that. I think you can still and make the put, same. You argument. put Kobe Bryant over Michael Jordan. If Only reason Jordan, yes. like, Rob, we talked before. Rob, I, Jordan already has a brand, and he already, already has, has a logo. So he right. can't, he can't, he has a logo. So you gotta yeah. ask, you take Mike out of it. I could do the argument for Kobe and Magic. I could see that argument, but when Derek said that, it made me think. Magic, a lot of his stuff was tied to Larry Bird. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but then you gotta also they, realize they too, that 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 Larry that Larry Bird and Magic Johnson um duo that brought NBA yeah. back. No, it and, did. That, and that it was because of Kobe. and the end of the line. What was it? Race. Yeah, yeah correct. Uh, and, and it, it, it line, you're right. It was they love that was they perfect. had the great white hope that played basketball Good against ball. this great black <laughs> yeah. athlete. They, they, yeah. that's what that it was, was with Larry Bird. Even LA, even LA, that's true. Even LA versus Boston, you had the limelight of Hollywood, and you had this kind of gritty, you know, eastern, you know, cold weather city. And so, yeah, I think it was, you know. Yeah. Well, okay. the, thing, the thing is, too, you can still change the logo of the NBA and not make it a person. You do realize that, too. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes. you know That's true. But like I said, like still having Jerry West as the logo of the thing, uh, I, I think it's time to give it a change. That's just my personal opinion. Like I said, there's a whole bunch of athletes we can name all day that have achieved a lot more than Jerry West. Right. You know wait, saying? wait, unpopular opinion. Wait until LeBron James retires and makes, makes him the NBA logo. He's the most complete uh, basketball player in. in no, don't in, even respond to that. That's, that's my nephew. That's my nephew doing that. He's trolling us. He's trolling us because he and I oh, have the. I see the yeah, last name. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's trolling us because right. we have this this magic. I mean, the Michael Jordan Lebron debate forever. And Kobe, by the way, is his guy. He believes yeah. Kobe is the greatest player to ever breathe air on this mm, planet. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. He was pretty yeah. good. He was well, good. hey, he's, he's 23 years old. That's why that's what they, they're supposed to do. <laughs> you you uh, know man, what? But, when I think about the, when we what I think about when we have this conversation, right? I think about how when I say that Jerry West, there's so many other people that achieved more than Jerry West and then he gets the honor of being like the NBA logo. It reminds me of Carl Lewis what he achieved in Olympics compared to what Bruce Jenner achieved and how big Bruce Jenner was. He, was you know, he just won, I think, one medal, if I'm not mistaken. One medal in a decathlon where Carl Lewis just destroyed the Olympics and yeah. never got the uh, clout that he got because yeah. white white America wanted to market um, right. wanted to market, right. um, Bruce. And that's basically it. It's a similarity there. You, they don't have to achieve as much as we do in order to be successful. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, that's true. I mean, that is what it is. But yeah. I mean, yeah, at at the, at the end of the day, um, I mean, we're talking about legendary players. I'm just saying, I I don't even know what Col what a Kobe. Someone mentioned uh, the Mamba mentality, which is mm -hmm. so true because I think that has transcended basketball. Yeah. You know, and I mean, I think there are different ways. I would love to see you know one of the, one of the awards. Rookie of the Year MVP or something like that named after him, but I do think it's time to change the logo. I think it's a lot of a lot of branding has changed. You you have to do that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's, that like he said, if it's a 60s and 70s logo, it's time because the handle yeah. that Jerry West had, these boys today forget it. I mean, it's correct. Okay. Correct. <laughs> correct. Yeah, Plus the, the shorts were too small back then too. <laughs> <laughs> but what well, they're doing well, now, well, man? Well, Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So one thing we forgot to do, and uh, you know, and we are like like the barbershop talk is talk about one of the greatest, one of the great contributors to, to hip hop music was our dear brother Prince Marky D, who passed away 
oh, suddenly from a heart attack at the age of 52, a day before his birthday. Any thoughts? Wow. Any time your first time ever hearing the Fat Boys record, anything like that? Anybody want to oh, say real man, quick? Man. I go back yeah. to Crush Groove. Crush Groove. Crush Groove is the first thing came to my mind as well. Yeah, yeah, Remember yeah. when you saw Crush Groove for the first time, man, in the movies, mm-hmm. and then what happened when you came back to school? <laughs> yeah, I, couldn't <laughs> even, I couldn't even get in the theater. It was sold out everywhere. Crush Groove. Yeah. And the, the crazy thing was the, the songs that Run DMC did in Crush Groove were actually old already. Yeah, they were actually yeah. old. The, the, that song, those songs had been out, and then right. they did the movie. But the the nation was so starved, the young people were so starved for this new movement. Um, that I remember my sister got a ticket, and she was able to see it, and I couldn't get in. And um, she was in there with her friends and stuff. But I mean, you just heard about it. But Run DMC was just, I mean, they we had never seen anything quite like it. Yeah. You know, I, I think right. Curtis Blow said that. Um, he said that that the first rap star was. Uh, I heard the first rap star was Curtis Blow. First superstar was LL. But in between there, Run DMC to me should be giving credit to me as possibly the greatest rap group. To me, they are because of, to me their production. Rick Rubin had them doing stuff in, in '83. Disorderlies, <laughs> you know? Yeah, disloyal orderlies. But no, no, they found. Yeah. But, but Prince Marky D. The funny thing was. I never really thought he was that fat back in the day in comparison to the yeah. other. Yeah, 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 yeah. No. He was the, the least fat fat skinny fat. fat he was the skinny fat boy. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. right, right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> skinny fat boy. Yeah, so, so we, it was so I funny, though. I that myself. I said, no, he's a skinny fat boy. Yeah, you so look, with that, um, you know, like you said, shout out to Prince Mark Dean. May his soul rest in peace. Um, Jamie, can you take us to our first commercial break? Times we saw like for the COVID pandemic, we saw a lot of people talking about education, and a lot of people was like, "Yo, we're tired of how schools are going." We heard black people talking about opening up their own schools, uh, uh, homeschooling, and you know, talking about this charter school movement and stuff like that. So we're very, very, very fortunate tonight to have one a bad brother, man. When I say this brother is bad, this brother has been on uh, TV, um, CNN, MSNBC. He's been a Roland Martin. He's one of the leading voices of education in our communities. He is a he is a motivational speaker, well renowned, renowned known. This brother has more bow ties than the nation of Islam. I'm talking about this, <laughs> a, this, this is a bad, bad man. This man has his own theme music when he walks into a room. <laughs> Damn, you can't bring in our dear brother, Dr. Steve Perry. <laughs> He doesn't, he doesn't let us down. He doesn't let us down. Let us down. <laughs> I can't. Thank you very much, everybody. Y'all have a good evening. <laughs> Dr. Perry, welcome, brother. Thank you for coming on tonight, man. We truly Glad honored to have you. Your, your oh, he mute. Somebody muted him. I had there you go. The Chinese food just got here. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> When you see my company walking behind me, that's it's all, it's all, it's all, hey man, this is this is how we are now. We live, you know how. Listen, think about the kids that we deal with. We see stuff in their backgrounds happen. Teachers are teaching uh, stuff. Hold, all kind yeah. of stuff going on, that, man. You know, and that's, what, that's really what it is. You know, one of the things that that bothers me to my core is when these teachers go soft on our children, and mm. and they 
they literally they keep saying we want to go back to school. What's stopping you? Go. Yeah, mm, yeah. Mm, mm, car don't work no more. Trains mm-hmm, don't yeah. go. Like what? Yeah. What's what's holding you up? You keep putting up. You keep moving the line because you really don't want to go back. Which is yeah. telling you more about what you really want to do before that than what you want to do now. Mm-hmm. Because for me, I can't wait to get back. Like we we've been back since the fall, and you see, like you just said. I mean, you can see in the room, you see one child sitting on one bed doing some, you know, doing whatever class they're doing. Another child sitting on the other bed doing whatever they're supposed to be doing. And this child's got his headphones on. He's sitting there like this trying to pay attention. It, it, this is not cool. And we can right. do better than this. And, 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 and so actually one of the coolest outcomes of these circumstances got, you know, got so, so many people passed away, including Prince Marky D. But we have begun to say, you know what? I can actually do better than what it was that they were doing for my kids. And that means it's game time. When black folks start to wake up, it's a problem. Yes, yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Listen, so, so, Dr. Perry, I worked in community schools for a number of years, right, in New York City, in Brooklyn, New York. And some of the things always came up, because you have a charter school. A lot of people in public education hate charter schools. What are your thoughts on what, why do you think that is and how can we change that mindset? Because I know what kind of charter school you have, but what, what, do you, what do you think that is? Well, what it is is that they have no idea what they're talking about. How could you hate something that you have no experience in? Very few of them have ever even gone into a charter school. Charter. If you ask them what a charter school is, they'll say it's a private school. Wrong. They'll say it is meant to privatize education. You ask them, what does it mean to privatize education? Y'all already gave it up education a while ago when you let these teachers unions come in. In 1968, um, the black people wanted community control. Mm-hmm. And so what we did was a school, Ocean Hill Brownsville, it, black teachers and a principal and parents said, we want to be able to hire who we want to be able to hire to work with our children. And the overwhelmingly white United Federation of Teachers in New York went on strike three times, shut it down, said, you will not do it. That's who is seeding that conversation. Those same racist people who fought to make sure that they could maintain absolute control of what your children do and don't learn are the same people who are in charge now. So would you trust them with your children? A charter school is a public school, whatever that means to some people, that allows people like us to decide that we're going to teach what we want to teach to our children. In that same time in 1968, the United Federation of Teachers decided to take out two chapters on Malcolm X in Harlem because they found it was too incendiary. Yeah, I I know why they don't want us. They don't want us to show that what they've been feeding us, telling us that it's poverty that is why the schools are failing. It's the parents are not involved. We need resources. No, mm -mm, that's not what it is. The resources that we lack are belief in our children. And so charter schools represent an existential threat to those people who wish to maintain the status quo which is a system that employs overwhelmingly white middle-class people from outside the community who would never send their children to those schools and who don't ever send their children to their schools. They just don't. That's their job. That's not their school. And until such time as we start pushing back and saying, tell me what's wrong with black and Latin people starting schools in our own community. Isn't that public? Isn't that what a public school is supposed to do? And then you take it one step further, you learn that through the Urban Renewal Act, through housing covenants and other strategies, African-Americans were put in ghettos. I mean, there's no real reason why you go from one school to the other other than the fact that it was zoned. Why is it zoned? So that black and Latin children stay far away from white kids. It just, I mean, it's just a simple thing. So why do those people hate this? Because they don't understand it first. Second, because they see us as an existential threat. We accepted a, a, a class of seniors this year, meaning that they were seniors. They just came to us from scratch. Like we didn't know them at the beginning of the year in Harlem. 
brought in the class of seniors, 100% of those kids are going to go to a four-year college this year. Why would you have an issue with that? Why would anyone have an issue with that? Like, what's your beef? Why is that a problem? Yeah. They say, well, you take all the kids from, no, I don't take them from anywhere. They left because they don't want to be with you. Mm-hmm. So why is that my problem? It, they won't leave if you provide a better uh, uh, resource. They don't want us to wake up to the truth. And the truth is what Malcolm is credited with saying, which is if you put your head in the lap of a man with a noose, whose fault is it that you were hung? That's right. Mm -hmm. You can't keep going back to the system and expecting that the system is going to do anything other than what it's done. And just because they hire a couple black folks who work there, make them principals and vice principals and all that, they're not changing the system. It's not going to change the system. What changes the system when brothers like you say, you know what? I got this. We'll open our own school. We'll hire who we want to hire. We'll fire who we want to fire. And we'll get her done. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Right. Perry, Dr. Perry, I want to ask you a question. Um, I, b- Before the show, you mean you spoke, right? I, we, I explained to you my background. I just wanted to know what is your opinion on police officers being in the schools? So it's not so much the police officers as in cops themselves, Mm -hmm. who's in the school and for what purpose. Mm -hmm. The truth is, um, I think it's a good idea for the police to have a relationship with people in the community uh, because things happen. And Mm -hmm. there are times when we need to call on you because the child comes in and something bad has happened to her. And if you're a stranger to her, she's not going to she's not going to talk to you. But we needed to talk to you because something really bad happened to her at home and we need that conversation to occur. But you're not an educator and you should not be put in situations where you are disciplining children. That is ridiculous. That's just a sign of weakness of the people in the building. If you need cops to run your school, then you should quit your job. Correct. 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 Like for real, don't go back. If you need to threaten a child with I'm going to call the police on you then you should stop working at that school. And maybe you should get out of education altogether. All you're together, the- all together yeah. brother. I've been in many yeah. rooms with that. So let me ask you a question, Dr. Perry. Somebody brought up, um, when do you think you should start teaching black history to, uh, to our children? And what parts should we start off at? That's one that's, that's, yeah. Yeah, so it's interesting. I didn't, I didn't know there was a time that you shouldn't teach it. Uh, we were buying our son's books about, about black people to teach them how to read. So I don't know that we should pull black history, so to speak, out as if it's a thing like science because black history takes place in science. It, it is part of everything. Um, and so I think that you start teaching it at at inception, you know, as people talk about reading to, to the baby when it's in the mother's womb, why not read there? And, and And recognize that the complexity of the African-American experience is such that it's not just about the people who we agree with who are black. That's part of the problem. We don't have to make uh, every black person uh, a Democrat. Um, We don't have to make every black person a civil rights worker. They could be any number of people and they could be on the other side. Until we start to understand the beauty of the black experience in its totality, we can't understand who we are today and where we're going. Dr. Dr. Perry, if I can ask, um, it, it seems today with pop culture, um, as far as video is concerned, the social media, I think young people don't necessarily associate education with success. Uh, those that seem to be affluent seem to do it through either athletics or entertainment in some capacity. Have you noticed that, that people now have stopped believing in, uh, I guess, young people that, a great education is the path to necessarily uh, whatever the American dream uh, is or was. It's interesting that you say that. So today I was having a conversation with one of our kids and he was saying that he's going to go to a community college as opposed to going to the four year college that's prepared to give him money to play football. That's a tough conversation to have. Mm-hmm. Because the first part of it is, if you were that good, you'd already know, son. Mm-hmm. Not a mystery. They'll be knocking on your door. 
it's it's a done it's it's a done deal. They yeah. know where you are. They yeah. really they're like the FBI. They actually mm-hmm. know. Who you yeah, are. yeah. If, I, if they can find you in the Dominican Republic, they, they can, can find, find you in, you in a, a, you know, so. find you anywhere. Yeah. So, there's always been hoop dreams. Like remember that movie from the nineties? Yeah. 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 yeah, There's always been that. I was watching, I told y'all, I was watching this documentary on Pele. I mean, that was the 50s, right? But there, we've always uh, had a certain idolatry towards athletes. They're, they're big, strong, and the like. But I will tell you, I don't think Black people have given up on education. I think that many African Americans don't believe that education and educators believe in them. And that's mm-hmm. where the problem lies. I feel like a lot of our kids and parents and grandparents, many of whom, when you do three generations, ain't even 50 years old, they're so t- they stack so tightly on top of one another that in many cases, they've actually had some of the same teachers in that same school. Mm-hmm. Wow. And so they don't believe that that school is going to give them an opportunity. So for them, no different than a lottery ticket, no different than getting high, no different than getting drunk. There's this big hope, this big dream mm. that they think only runs through letting their bodies be beaten up, um, that they're going to uh, achieve their goals. So I don't know, we've always believed in athletics, even before people became rich as athletes. Joe Lewis, right? Was mm-hmm a whole bunch of people wanting to fight, right? He, he carried the hopes He carried the hopes of black America on his back, right? Yeah. Was, you know. I, yeah. Let me ask you I a think, question. Okay, Rob, go ahead, Roger. No, I was, was just going to say really quickly, um, Dr. Perry, I also think that's also a reason why a lot of kids gravitate to the gang culture because they feel like the gang culture has their interests, more of their interests at heart than anybody else. So I, so I, I 100% agree with you that one of the main reasons why boys in particular affiliate with gangs, it's not, okay, you know, you talk about the protection side of it, there's that, whatever. Mm -hmm. But it really has more to do with, they actually believe these young brothers love them. They actually tell them that they Mm -hmm. love them. Yeah, yeah, I'm your brother, I got your back, I'm your blood, yeah. You know, in regards to that though, we, we, we know like, let's say we have, we know the importance of, let's say, black male teachers. All right. We've had research on that done. And um, how do we get more of them to become teachers and, you know, to become sort of like, you know, role models or just some, you know, something that they can model themselves after? And how do we get more? Um, how do we get that input from, let's say, HBCUs or anything? Like, what are your thoughts on that? So there are a lot of ways that that could happen. I mentioned to you before about 1968 uh, uh, teacher strikes in New York City. In the 60s, <clears throat> teachers unions created civil service examinations, much like they have for the police and fire, right? And you guys understand what the civil service examinations were meant to do. They were supposed to keep certain people out. Sure. And so the same thing occurs in teaching. In teaching, there are, there are civil service examinations that you have to take. It's like a praxis exam is what it's called. And what we know is that 65% of black people who take the practice practice exam, praxis exam, sorry, um, fail it the first time they take it. Yet we know that the praxis exams passage is no indication of your ability to teach. So it begs the question, why then do you have the exam if all it does is stop black people from becoming teachers? Mm. And teaching is a really good job. It's a good job in a lot of ways because what it does at the very least is it allows you to have a schedule similar to your children. Mm-hmm. It also does it allows you to do things with your children in the community so you can become a productive member of the community. You get out when everybody else does. You coach youth football or basketball or cheer or chess or what have you. You could become a meaningful, engaged member of the community. There's so many things that you can do. And so the question then becomes, why is it that more people are not teachers? It's not because of some of the things that we think you'll hear people say, well, teachers don't get paid enough. That's actually not true. In New York, it's the average teacher is making almost $80,000 a year. I just want to point that out. I want to stop and pause. I want to pause there real hard. The average teacher in New York City is making eighty thousand dollars a year for one hundred and eighty eighty days. And brother, a and brother, tell them yeah. how much the principals and assistant principals make because I know I know the answer. Then sorry, the, the, <laughs> depending on where you are, a buck fifty, one seventy five, two hundred. Yeah, 
$200,000 to be a principal of a failed school. Two, yeah. I want to, again, I just want to stop. Like we're going to, we're going to have a conversation. If you want to know just how, you know, you hear people say teachers are underpaid and overworked, go into the parking lot. Look at their cars. That's right. You got a point. Look at their cars. <laughs> now, I, you know, I've always wanted to know, I've always wanted to know Dr. Perry, because I'm sure there's, there's a myriad of things that you could have done. Where did you get your drive from? I've always believed, and I've worked in a, the gospel ministry for, for 30 years, and I, I do that because I was called to do it. And I always believe that teaching is or should be a calling. I don't think a person uh, should just go into it because I think you have to have some skin in the game when it comes to, I think mm -hmm. you should have a passion for young people. But a little, tell people a little bit about you, about what made you, what made you become Dr. Perry. So... I was born on my mother's 16th birthday. Um, it, you know, if, if you're black in America and you grew up from the seventies backwards, chances are you grew up in a rough situation. I mean, it's just kind of the, the kind of the thing we all, we all got the markings of people who've grown up under those circumstances. If nothing else, you were black, right? Mm -hmm. Even if you weren't poor, you were black. So, Poverty and and is is trumped by blackness every day. Every You're day. from New York. I am not. I'm from Connecticut, and so um, lived in public housing until I was in my early 20s. And my mother was on the tenants association in our project. So I don't know if she was a president or the vice president because there was only two people on the tenants association. But I used to go to the meetings with her, and um, when I was there. I would see her talking and asking for things that I thought we should, it, like even as a child, it seemed like, why is my mother having to ask y'all for this? Like this seemed, even I understand that this is like, why wouldn't you uh, make sure that our houses don't look like we live in squalor? Like, why is that? Why is she asking you for that? Like we didn't do anything wrong. We pay our rent. I know that it may not be a lot, but we pay it. And so early on, I felt like I had to do something. Um, I, I, I don't know. I thought I was a superhero. I remember one time I looked at, I, I watched Superman, the TV show and the black and white TV show. And I remember he was, uh, he used his eyes to bend steel, like, it, you know, like lasers. Mm -hmm. And I went outside and I looked at the a basketball hoop and I squinted and I squinted. And I was like, Psh, I could bend if I want to. I just don't really want to right now. So I couldn't be convinced. <laughs> I couldn't be convinced even by the facts that, that what I believed was impossible. And so fast forward, I had started a not-for-profit organization that worked with kids who be the first in their family to go to four-year college. I had gone through one. It's an upper bound program. And so I started one. And what was happening was I would work with kids during the summer for six weeks to get them to a place where they felt confident in their uh, academic ability and they saw themselves as smart. And then I would put them back in the neighborhood schools and it wouldn't even take two weeks, man. Like everything that I, it, it wouldn't even, sometimes it'd be like, I drop them off there on Monday by like Wednesday. I'm getting calls from the school like, yo, you need to come get your boy Tavon. Like, what do you what, what is Tavon doing? Like, what do you mean? What is he what why what what did he do? And then I was going into the schools, and when I would go into the schools, I could easily find the lowest classes because I just looked for the classes with the most black kids in it. And many of those kids were my kids, and I had them over the summer, and I know that they weren't low. Cause I actually had the, the data, I had the test to show that they actually were not low. And I remember one time I went and asked a school that was supposed to be a suburban school where my kids were, my, my students were, I asked them, why is it that all my kids keep ending up in this goofy class called extended algebra, which was three semesters of algebra. So they would take algebra in their freshman year, first and second semester, and they would take algebra again, same algebra, in their uh, sophomore year, and then they wouldn't take another math class again until their junior year, which would be an extended geometry class, which meant in terms of the SAT, they wouldn't have the requisite math that they needed in order to do well on the SAT. So I was, I mean, I was just a kid, I was young, and I asked, I was just asking around, I wasn't even, I don't know real mission, you dig? Like it wasn't a big, like I wasn't trying to hustle anybody, I just wanted to understand how were the kids I had during the summer who took algebra based upon the textbooks that you gave me from your school with teachers from your school. How is it that I had them over the summer? Even if they got a C, that, that should be justification for them not to be in a class that's actually extended, right? Like they already passed it 
for six weeks. They passed the first six weeks of the class. Sorry. Um, so just trying to figure out what it was that they needed to do. And every time I asked the question, nobody had an answer. And, and, and you know, my grandma would say, bless their hearts. Somebody said, well, if you get us the list of the kids who are from your program, we'll take them out of the class. And I said, well, yeah, I, I already knew that was going to I'm taking them out. But why do they keep ending up there? Like, why am I having this conversation with y'all every year? And it's just because of their color. It had nothing else to do. They, they didn't have, I asked them, is there a test that I could prep them for during the summer so that we won't keep having to have this conversation? And the lady was really kind. She was a sweet lady. This older white lady. She was, you know, I'm sorry, but I get that you're sorry, but like, why is it happening? And what I found out was that in, in the seventh and eighth grade, guidance counselors and teachers were recommending kids for certain level classes based upon their behavior or what they perceived their behavior to be. And you can imagine all the kids who were black and Latin kept ending up in these lower, most all it kept ending up in these lower classes. And so I finished here. The real kick in the pants was when my man, who I'd gone to college with, who was college educated, his wife's a nurse, he called me, his kids had gone to this particular school in, in a place called Windsor, Connecticut, which is outside of Hartford. Mm-hmm. He said, hey, my daughter just got um, recommended for this leadership program. I said, what leadership program? Yeah, there's no leadership program in that school because I worked in the school. Like you was a cop, I worked as you know somebody was outside. I worked in the school and I knew which programs they had. You know what I mean? I yeah. said well, they, they have a new leadership. Program? He said, yeah, and he told me the name of. It. Now he was a teacher in another city, and I said, what's the name of it? He told me the name of it. I said, bruh, that is not a leadership program. That's a program for bad, bad behaving kids. What they do is they pull them out of the school day, out of their regular classes, and then put them in this group session. And they'll sit there in this group for a whole period or two talking about their quote unquote problems. Nobody's ever asked the teachers, like, do y'all sit, make them talk about their problems? Because maybe that's really what the problem is, not the kids. Maybe it's the grown people working in school. And I just said, you know, I can't do this anymore. Like, I can't keep sending kids back to this foolishness. And I know and, and I knew it. You understand? Like. And it didn't mean these were mean people, but they were doing bad things to kids. They were really doing bad things to kids. And it was like carbon monoxide. By the time you recognize it, it's a wrap. And they were making these decisions for kids who were 10, 11, 12 years old. And, and, and once they made that decision, they put them in this lower track. The kids couldn't get out. When they were pulling his daughter out of the class, she was missing class time. Or they had a schedule for kids like her. So they left a blank in their school day. So they leave a blank in their school day so they can only put them in lower classes. That's just that regular garden variety systemic racism. And and, and so I said, you know what? I could suck at least as bad as they are running schools. I give it. Let me me ask you a question, doctor. Since, you know, we saw in 2020 that uh, we saw the discrimination in education because of the pandemic and, and resources and stuff like that. How do you see how how did it affect your school for one thing and everything? Like how did you adjust to doing it? And now if you was if you was chancellor, like we know we've seen our chancellor just step down in New York City. If you was chancellor of in Connecticut or New York City, how would you make the steps to bring in that divide of technology and, and information uh uh closer together than what we've seen in the pandemic? How would you prepare if we would go through something like this again? And how did it affect you before? So one of the reasons why I'm not the chancellor is because of my answer that I'm gonna give you. I was asked years ago uh, by Cory Booker uh, to consider becoming the uh, commissioner of Newark Public Schools. And I said to him, bro, you don't want me to do that. Like you got aspirations other than this. What I'm gonna do, you ain't gonna like. (laughs) (laughs) I feel you on that. I'm gonna solve your problem. But But you're not gonna be too popular with doing it. No. There's, I would free the children from the failed school system. It's just what it is. The school system is designed, maintained, and funded to destroy black and Latin children. And if you think anything other than that, then you haven't been paying attention for the past 300 years. It's just the way it is. And just because they hire a person who is a person of color, uh, a person um, who comes from the community, that person by her or himself can do nothing to that system. The system is designed to get the results that it consistently gets. So it's not 
you'll often hear people say it's a resource gap. That's just not true. It actually isn't true. They'll say, well, in the the suburbs, they get more money than they do in urban centers. That's not always the case. In fact, if you want to spend, you want to know where we spend the most money on children that's in prison. Mm -hmm. So it's not money. So then the best place, therefore, if we're just going where the money goes, is to send a child to prison. But that's not what we're going to say. The truth is that the biggest resource gap is the belief gap. In schools where, and you, those of you who've worked in schools, you know, you hear how people talk to kids. Mm-hmm. I mean, let's just call it what it is. Like what, we keep acting like we didn't hear that teacher talk to kids like that. You're like, yo, <laughs> wow. If his mother heard you say that, you would get scraped. Yeah. Like seriously, that like you, you get away with that because nobody can hear you. And because when the kid says that you said what you said, you going to already clean up and be professional. And I don't understand why he's saying that. I would never say anything like that. Blah, blah, blah. Our kids are under attack by the people who are being paid to educate them. And, 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 and the attack comes in many forms. One t- attack is what George Bush called the uh, low expectations of soft bigotry, which is, oh, no, I don't think you should have to do this. Like, we've had it in my own schools where people will say, this year, uh, we had a teacher say, and he's a brother, say, it's unfair for you to be given this test. Bruh, are you serious right now? I mean, you out your mind. Yeah. It's not a resource. That's just lowering the expectations because you think that they might fail it. What does that even mean? It doesn't make sense. We have to. See the truth for what it is. Dr. King said, American schools do not know what to teach or how to teach. That was Dr. Martin Luther King in his final book, Where Do We Go From Here? Community Chaos, in the final chapter. Dr. King said that the schools were not serving our children. It's not about, you hear the stories of, no, we don't have any textbooks. Why? Why don't you have textbooks? Why? What are you spending your money on? You sure ain't cutting. You sure ain't cutting no teacher salaries. You sure ain't cutting no principal salaries. The buildings are all paid for. The let me, rent- ask, you, let me ask you: How would you tell the parents to advocate? What, how, what would you be your first step? Because I know, like, you want to lead things or lead leaders on helping parents navigate through the systems. How, how would you first get the parents to um, start advocating? What would you first tell them how to advocate for the child? In New York City, you guys, we have choice in New York. So I would say. Stop taking the most convenient route to education, meaning the school that's closest to your house and pick the school that's closest to your heart. Choose another school. Vote with your feet. You can't make somebody love your child. And and to love your child doesn't mean that you think that they're sweet and nice and kind. It means to push them academically. And that's not what they're doing. You can go and see. We... (laughs) When we opened our school in Harlem, 95% of our sixth graders and 94% of our seventh graders were below grade level in in, in ELA, English language arts. They came from all five boroughs. 99% of our sixth graders and 100% of our seventh graders were below grade level in math. 100%. Do you honestly believe that those children are just all dumb? Like, seriously? Give them an iPhone. Give them this technology. Give them anything. And they can do anything anybody in the world can do with it. I'll put kids from Harlem, from the Bronx, from Brooklyn, from anywhere, Staten Island, all five boroughs. Give them this technology and put them in front of anyone on Earth, South Korea, North Korea, China, Switzerland, anywhere, they can rock with them. Yep. Yeah. Okay? I worked at Boys and Girls. Our debate team beat kids in South Africa, all type of thing. Our kids were amazing, and you know they were saying it's a failing school, but they tore they tore ass. <laughs> Doc, <laughs> they yeah. they whipped ass in debate. They whipped ass in debate, brother. Doctor, so, we have a we have a question from Crystal. Um, oh. What do you think about alternative schools? It depends on. I think that it's important that. Um, we have as many types of schools as possible. 
it's not the type of school that makes it good or bad. It's the way the school is run. So if I know that there are some children for whom the traditional academic experience is just not for them. It's just not for whatever reason. It could be because of their interest. It could be because of trauma. It could be because, because of both. I, I don't know why. And, you know, having them wake up at 5 a.m. and get on a train and get to school by 630. It's just not for them. It, it's just not. So we have to have something different than um, than the traditional brick and mortar, what you see. But what, the, what, go ahead. I'm sorry, what are your thoughts on a, a, a standard sort of standard supplemental national uh, black uh, agenda or black, uh, you know, educational system for us, you know, um, like a curriculum, you know? If you could get black people to agree on what to serve, <laughs> at the family reunion, <laughs> I'll be impressed. Uh -huh. so, let alone getting black people to agree on which figures are important to dis to discover through inquiry. So I think that there's a great deal to be said about some of the regionalism. There are people who we would consider heroic who are from the Midwest, but here are on the East Coast, maybe not so much, you know? We have our own people who we would rock with, who, to, who tell a different story. Then there's those people who lead to national prominence, who come from particular areas. I don't think that the, like in Connecticut, we passed a law that says that um, black history must be taught in all schools. And you think that's, let's go. Let me give you a little something about that. 94% uh, uh, of all teachers in the state of Connecticut are black. The four percent, brother. Four. Wow. wow. <laughs> so, so you passed the law to teach black history, yet you've not passed the law to require black people to teach it. Right. Yeah. That's like asking people to come in and teach Spanish who've never spoken Spanish before, right. but who love a chalupa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's it's so crazy because you have schools. I went to Benedict College. You know, we want to lead in schools of putting out black teachers out in the, in America. Do Connecticut and places like that? We have my brother's keeper and stuff like that. Do they actively actively go and recruit into our, in our schools? No, oh, I told you why. The issue is because there's a there's a lot there's a lot that goes into this, but it starts with the fact that right now, in New York and in Connecticut, I, I, let me give you a real world. So New York State SUNY decided that there were not enough people of color teaching. SUNY decided this. So what SUNY said was, what we're going to do is we're going to allow for the creation of an apprentice program. Meaning that if a teacher, if, a, if we hire somebody who was a cop initially, who has got a bachelor's degree and wants to come back and teach math, then if he works at our school for a year and his, is satisfactory in his performance as evidenced by him taking certain courses and doing what his principal uh, uh, says that he must do, then we can certify him to be a teacher in the state of New York. That seems like it makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. Really simple, right? Because that that means that we could go to a place like Puerto Rico, we could go to Dominican Republic, we could go to Connecticut, we could go to anywhere, we could go to uh, a, a college and say, talk to all the football players and say, "Hey, gentlemen, how many y'all want to be teachers?" The United Federation of Teachers, the Teachers Union, sued the state, and the state lost. And so now that apprenticeship program was killed by the United Federation of Teachers who claims that they want to have diversity. Mm. And let me explain to you how you become a teacher now in New York City, the same way that you would have in 1968, which means mm. you have to major in education as an undergrad. How many people you know major in education as an undergrad who are black and male? Then you, if you can go to an alternative route to certification, but you have to have a certain GPA. Many brothers who went to college, you went to college on a sports scholarship, many, not all, but many. And then those that didn't, in many cases, came from low performing schools. And in the low performing schools, they were undereducated. So they struggled in many cases. Very few brothers came out of college, come out of college with high GPAs, just fact. Doesn't mean they're less intelligent. It just means that they just didn't come out with high GPAs. So they don't have a high. And then the other way you can get past some of these um, certifications is if you have a high SAT score, again, 
African-American males have some of the lowest SAT scores across the board. So here are all these systemic barriers in place. SUNY, the State University of New York, put in place a policy that would have made it possible for all of you brothers to become teachers. Be paid full salary, full benefits, and after just one year, you'd be a certified teacher. And the teachers union sued them and won. Wow. Mm. Wow. It's sad, man. You know, it, we can go on forever. Bro, I got this many questions still for you, but I, I'm a, it's going to be another date. So my last and final, this is the hardest question you probably got. Roland Martin never asked you this. Oprah never asked you this. T.D. Jakes, you probably never heard nothing like this before. What's your top five rappers of all time, brother? So Here we go. Now we're talking. <laughs> you know, Honestly, obviously you got to go with Big because he's big, right? It just doesn't, you just can't get past that. But this is where it starts to get dicey after that. I know Ye is crazy, but he's talented, like absurdly talented um, in a way in which you just can't look past him. The same thing can be said, not, not the crazy part. Then you have to, like we always look past KRS like he wasn't who he was. 25 albums, he's 25. Hey. We just we, we have to think about when we think about KRS, what we have to recognize is that he was a kid. Like he was a young man mm. saying the things that he was saying. He was that like we talk about woke. He was that then. Right. And he, you could like rock a party with that. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. And then I, for me, I, Chuck D is just. Oh, that's my guy. I mean, I you love know. Chuck. To me, I tell people this all the time. Chuck D was more gangster than NWA because he really had the FBI on his ass. Like yeah. just, but, but, yeah. but, you know, that, that's why I tell people that. People don't understand. Like, they said it for saying some real hood stuff. He had it for educating people it's and waking, a white, and waking right. up white folks. That was more right. dangerous than the NWA. Yeah. Stuff. What people right. don't, what people, I, I don't think, you know, we have these conversations about rappers and we're typically talking about sales, record sales. And, you know, you can't argue with Drake sold a lot of records. You can't argue with like a lot of people. Hammer sold a lot of records. Like you can't argue with the fact that these guys sold a lot of records. But for me, I want to impact player. Like I want to find people who, when when the game is over, like who do I look up and think? But they changed the way that we take music in. De La Soul for me as a crew. Mm -hmm. Who's your last? I would go with De La Soul as, as my as my crew. Okay, okay. I would go with De La Soul as my crew, crew because they changed like they they took the consciousness of, of what was going on in that time mm -hmm. that black medallions no gold, mm -hmm. but then they took it to a whole other daisy age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Native I mean, tongue, native tongue, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, 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 Dr. Perry, anything you want to promote? Anything you want to let the people know before we let you go? So real quick, actually, one, apply to our schools, go to capitalprep.org. We are capitalprep.org because we want your children to come to our schools. And then two, um, uh, breaking news at the final. This is the final season for Fix My Life. Ian Van Zandt's Fix My Life. And so the final season is now and the final episode is on March 15th. And I need you all to watch that. I just Absolutely. need you all to watch that. March 15th. Because. We'll be in there. Nice. Thank you, gentlemen. I really do. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, so brother. I'd love to have you come back welcome. again. Like, I would love to have you come back again, man. I could talk to you for four hours, man. I'd, I'd be honored. I, I genuinely, and, and, and as I go, let me also say thank you for the work that you brothers do, not just up here, but what you do in real life. Cats don't understand the work that you do, and, and that sometimes I get to be on television and, and people think that I do something different than you. Let me, let me be the first to say that you are the soldiers that are making things happen. So I deeply appreciate the work that you Thank do. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Perry. It's been an get, honor to have you on the show. Get to the Chinese Thank food you. before it get cold, bro. Get to the Chinese food before it get cold. <laughs> <laughs> We're about to go watch The Black Messiah. Oh, oh, okay. oh man. We'll, we, we'll chop it up about that later on. <laughs> real, real quick before I go, let me tell y'all, you must watch this documentary called Mully. M-U-L-L-Y. I'm telling you, get your family there. It is one of the best documents you have ever seen in your life. I promise you. I promise you. I promise what you. What is it on? What's it on? I don't want to tell you anything else about it. Just please watch it. Well, what network? No, no network. What network oh, is it on? on? I think it is. Okay. okay. All right, cool. Thank you, brother. Appreciate Thanks you so much. Man. We love you, man.
Keep hey, fighting stop. the fight for us, man. Thank you a lot, brother. Have Appreciate a great you. night. Appreciate you. All right. Oh, you think? Dr. Kelvin's Perry in the middle. Dropped some deep stuff. Dropped some deep stuff, man. A lot of knowledge, man. That was that was wonderful. Like I love talking to I've been in rooms and conferences where I've been like, I'm a spec mm-hmm. <laughs> compared to all, you know the white educators in the room. So it was like that felt good to see like his brother like that out there. So I, I can't wait to talk to the brother again, man. Really yeah, appreciate absolutely. it. Absolutely. Really appreciate absolutely. the talk. You know, and I want to make sure that we still keep on the uh so we still um we still got a long fight to go. It's it's, it's hard to see. Like, uh, it's crazy when he said four percent. That really messed my mind. I'm like four yeah. percent in a state like Connecticut is one of the richest states in the country. I mean, you only got four percent of people look like the kids we are, like kids in Danbury and places like that. Where it's hard, they can't. You know, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. To say yeah, the, the the one thing too he brought up about the teachers union. Me and you are very familiar with the teachers union. These yes. they do a lot of things that stand in the way of the progression of our children. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? They. The and like I said, I've seen teachers. They they um they got a very strong union. Some teachers should be fired, and they still keep their job. Oh. They protect them left and right. And sometimes teachers will go sit in this place called the rubber rubber room, and they'll collect a check all year and done oh, nothing. Yeah, people don't understand. Like it's, when teachers get tenured, a teacher can literally come yeah. into a, a room, sniff coke off somebody's body, <laughs> and can't get fired. So no, so it's it's, it's really it's and not get fired and not get fired and not get not get, get yeah. fired. The only thing you don't can't you can't do is you can't hit or touch kids. You know that's the only thing. But it's a hard, strong union. That's strong. That union might be stronger than the police union, stronger than the, the sanitation union. Yeah, I, I would know, say it is. Be, I would say I it mean, is. As a as a father, you know, I, I I do respect the job that they do. You know what I mean? Um, I I, I don't ha- I don't have a problem with unions, and I respect the, the job that all teachers do. But that's a pretty frightening thing that you know that someone, like you said, like they, they can't get fired for any reason, yeah. and 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 I, and I wouldn't want them to. I think they do a, a, an incredible job. Some of them, most of them, I give them all. Well, they give try to give them benefit of the doubt. I don't know yeah. if have some uh, amazing teachers in our children's lives. You know that they are really still in touch with it a lot, a lot of ways. You know, mm-hmm. yeah. they still ask all my kids, so um, I respect that. But you know, but it's just unfortunate yeah. that you yeah. have that. Oh. So we have another educator coming in. Kelvin, can you bring in our next educator and tell, and tell a little bit about him? Well, gentlemen, I got to tell you, I'm very, very excited. This is uh, one of not only one of my cl- closest friends in the world, but one of my favorite people in the world. Um, I've known her uh, since 2009. We went to grad school together, went to seminary together, actually. Uh, she is the senior pastor of the Church of the Resurrection in Harlem, New York. Um, she is also my co-laborer in the gospel, um, a mother. Um, a, a pastor, a educator, the head of the Booker T. Washington, uh, Washington Learning Center in East Harlem, New York, uh, 325 101st Street um, in Harlem, New York. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome to the Let's Chop It Up family, my friend, the pastor, Kimberly Wright. Well, hey, what's, what's going on? What's going on, sister? How you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. I'm glad to be with you all. I know, glad to you, have I, you. Glad to have you. I haven't seen you in a long time. I, I know. Time. I know. Too long. We got to figure that out. That's because COVID happened. COVID. COVID. <laughs> COVID. I, don't, I, don't know if, I don't know if the pastor remembers me. Uh, I was behind a camera last time I saw. But, uh... Yes, I do. I absolutely do. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, Pastor, I'm going to start with the first question. Since you said about COVID, how did COVID affect the community that you serve and how did it affect the young people and what have you been doing from 2020? The, the help out the community and and what are some of the things that you have seen? Oh Lord, I mean, <laughs> this could be a whole show by itself. <laughs> um, so I will tell you um, that as soon as COVID happened, we had to shut down um, our after school program, our preschool program. We were getting ready for summer camp, which did not happen last year. And um, right away, um, I I think that we are just a church that's very um, rooted in our community. And so, you know, it's kind of like, here's a crisis. The first thing is like, let's make sure everyone is safe. I'm not one of the pastors who is like, you know, the blood of Jesus, we're going to keep coming to church and God is going to take care of us. I was like, okay, everybody go home. The Lord warned us, right? The, the, The writing is on the wall. Everybody go home and be safe and let's figure this all out. And then, you know, and then we started getting the body count. And um, for me, it's it's personally very high, right? So um, so I'm, I'm very grateful we have lost no one 
in our church to COVID, thank God. Um, but right away, we, we knew what we were supposed to be doing. We saw that people were dying and we started what we call a Let's Live campaign. So I was very concerned about all the teenagers who are out in the street, not wearing masks. You know, I know like, you know, it's, it's not fashionable. It doesn't look cool. You look vulnerable, um, you know, cause you look like you're trying to protect yourself and you're not supposed to try to protect yourself from nothing, but maybe a bullet, maybe you ain't even supposed to do that. I don't know. But um, I just saw a lot of young men hanging out way too much. And I know, you know, our kids go home to parents and grandparents. We live in close proximity to one another here. And two thirds of people who have died from COVID have died or, or who have been infected have been infected by family members, by people they live with. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, being concerned for not only our young people, but the people they live with who are very vulnerable, we, we, we gave out masks, we gave, you know, water, food, like, you know, we gave out other stuff to make getting a mask a conversation and then to talk about safety. Um, and then we reopened, we opened our preschool back up and now we have a remote learning lab. So our kids, we know our kids are home suffering. This is the worst thing that could have ever happened to our children. And let me just say that our children and our seniors, they are the superheroes. They are the warriors of COVID. Like what is how our kids are being decimated right now. We are losing our children, their mental health, their emotional well-being, their spiritual well, spiritual well-being physically. They're not playing. They're not outside. They're not active. Um, they are depressed. They are anxious. They're worried for themselves, for their parents. They're grieving. They miss school. They miss their activities. My daughter was supposed to graduate in May. No graduation from her for her from college. My son was due to be a lead in a play at school, and he had a birthday May, March 29th. All of that, his 16th birthday, all of that was missed. And so, you know, all of our children have a story about what's missing, what's not happening. Um, and then, um, you know, so we know our kids needed to get out of their houses. All of our parents are not equipped to take care of their children. Some houses have multiple children. Some parents are going to work and can't stay home, right? It's like everyone has a different scenario and we wanted to respond the best way we could in the way that, that we're able to. And so we open back up, we have a remote learning lab for, for kids and we, we have our preschool open. We will be open this summer. We have found the research says that children are safer than they are at home. Um, and so we're, we're doing that. I've buried a lot of people um, because of COVID. So it has personally really affected me. Um, but you know, I know I have to keep going. So yeah. that's what we're doing. We're going, we're in the middle of a war and we're trying yeah. to, I don't know if we can win at this point, 500,000 people, right? So mm -hmm. we've already lost, but we're trying to save as many as we can. Mm -hmm. Pastor Kim, I, I, you know, I, I'm always fascinated by your story and um, many people don't know you have five degrees. Uh, you are a product of East Harlem. Um, what has made you commit to the neighborhood? You are, you are as dedicated as anybody I've ever met in my life, as far as, especially as far as ministry is concerned. The, the passion that you have for the kids is, is unparalleled. What made you stay there and, and, and what drives you? So I, I want to say it's a couple things. One is that I grew up in East Harlem. When it was East Harlem District 4 had an excellent school system. I was well educated in East Harlem. I was well prepared um, for the scholarship that I got to go to a New England boarding school for high school. And um, I got there and had absolute culture shock and wanted to come home where I was loved and nurtured and educated and well taken care of. Oh, oh man! Yeah, All right, Jamie will get her back. He'll get her back. Like, yeah, thanks, yeah. Bill. Lost the. Yeah, you, know, you know what? You know what the best. So, like, give give a little people some things about the past. Well, we I'll, I'll tell you. You know, so she has, has started a a school. Um, her her former pastor, Reverend uh, Leroy Rixey, um, her predecessor started. He had this vision for this, this ministry in Harlem. And, and the thing that I would, uh, that I love about her and, and you all would appreciate this is, um, she, you're not going to see her flying around in a Learjet. You're not going to see her in a Bentley or whatever. She's a person that genuinely is for the people. 
And um, as she rejoins us, she can tell her own story, but I could just tell you a first uh, hand account that she definitely served. She's a true uh, disciple of Christ and a champion for people. But uh, you can take it back, Pastor Kim. <laughs> um, so, I, you know, I went away to boarding school and what I found out was that, you know, there are schools that educate their children in a way that's very different than the way we educate ours. Um, those schools um, are built to create the leaders of this world, not just this country, but of the world. Um, they are taught differently. They're taught to think differently and the expectation of those children, very, very different. Those children who are dynastically wealthy, um, you know, I, I guess a lot of us would call them trust fund babies. Those kids are in school right now. They're, they're, those children are in school every day right now and going to music classes and art classes and dance classes and whatever other classes and they're vacationing. Life has not stopped. They put a mask on and they have kept it moving while we have been paralyzed. So anyway, I went to boarding school and then I came back my senior year because I hated it. I hated feeling like a visitor and an unwanted guest in a culture where I knew, like in a system that I knew was not created for me. And so I came back to New York. I graduated um, from Manhattan Center for Math and Science, the first graduating class. Um, and I graduated with brilliant young people of color. Our whole class went to four-year colleges. I think one of our one student, some of them Ivy League schools, I think one student went into the, uh, into the uh, arm, armed services. Um, so I was, I, I will also say the other side of my story is that while I was, uh, I always did well in school, I was a menace to society. So I was <laughs> addicted to drugs. I sold drugs. I ran the streets. I was promiscuous. I, you know, I mean, I was a problem child in every way of the world word. I was a problem in this community. And so I owe this community a lot. It was nothing but good to me, and I wreaked havoc here. Mm. Um, I will also say, though, I love it here. I love, I love my community, and I love my people. I love Black and Latino people. So this is home, and it's crazy because when I when people know that I've gone away to college, I went to prep school. I, you know, I I can make a choice and be somewhere else, and so. You know, people within the community are always like, why you come back here? Why you want to be here? I'm like, do you understand what you're saying about yourself? Yeah. Do you, do you mm -hmm. like, why would you ask me that question? Where else would mm -hmm. I rather be? Mm -hmm. Where else do I want to live? Who else do I want to work with and for? Who else mm -hmm. would I rather serve? My biggest nightmare would be having to get on a train in the morning and go into some office building downtown and punch a clock. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a question. Like, what what made you choose the name Booker T. Washington? Of all of all the people you could have chosen, what made you go with that name? Well, I didn't choose it. My um, the Booker T. Washington Learning Center was started a year before I got here by my former pastor. So okay. um, he chose it, and then he introduced me to Booker T. And then I also learned about George Washington Carver, who worked with Booker T. Washington at Tuskegee University. Um, which was not Tuskegee University when they worked there. It was a normal and industrial school. But um, I learned this amazing philosophy. Um, and I also was just so inspired by like the strength, the wisdom, the brilliance, and the dedication of Booker T to his people. And his literally, if you read up from slavery, literally, his willingness to make something out of nothing. Like when he he finished at Hampton, they called him to go to Tuskegee and it was the town of Tuskegee, not the school. There was nothing there. He made the bricks with his hands. He The students figured out how to make the bricks. And if you've ever been to Tuskegee, you would imagine when I read, when I was reading about it, you would imagine like what, so like, what could the buildings look like? Little square things with little bricks, like, how good could this be architecturally? How, right? If you go there and you see the buildings, I think it's 21 buildings or something was made by the students. And you see what is built there. It is majestic. It is excellent. It is beautiful. It is nothing short of miraculous. Um, and so it was, you know, a man who came out of slavery, so who had everything working against him in many ways, I feel as a black woman, that's my life and growing up poor um, and being trauma, all the trauma I've had in my life. So, 
you know, he came out of slavery and determined that economic freedom was the way to go. And the only way he thought economic freedom would happen for his people is if he built an institution, which is, you know, we have to be institution building builders. Um, he built an institution that would serve to make other people institution builders, right? So, and would allow them to be economically free from um, dependency on white people, white money, white systems, and, and all of that. So um, I know he, you know, I mean, I, I don't have to keep defending him, but, you know, he gets a bad rap. He really does. He and does, but that's, I, I don't we go, we can go, yeah, I ain't going to go on that, but, you know, he does get a little bad rap. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> we, we would understand the historical context, and we would understand um, where he was in this country. He was in the South, not the North. He had been a slave. He wasn't born free. Mm -hmm. He went to Hampton. He didn't go to Harvard, right? Completely different agenda, and we don't have to pit one against the other. But um, he had nothing but the right intentions for his people. And when we look at how the people he served and developed and groomed were doing, right, during the period of Reconstruction, they're doing better, arguably, than we are doing right now. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, um, I want to ask. I want to ask you a question, Reverend. Right. Um, I was just having a conversation earlier today with my wife, and she brought to my attention like um, this article that she was reading about this young lady that during the pandemic she was starving, like she couldn't get anything to eat. She's going to school. She's remote learning, and you know, food is something we take for granted on a daily basis. You know what I mean? But are you noticing in 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 the area that you basically help? Are you noticing kids being hungry on a daily basis? Yes. So one of the things I noticed, because I'm a mama who shops at the local grocery store, is that the mm. price of food is through the roof. Correct. It's going up a lot. Like, it's, I, like, it's crazy. I'm like, aren't we in a pandemic? Shouldn't we be trying to keep the prices down? Even as yeah. store owners, like just being sensitive to your community, right? Like uh, even if what you've had to buy has gone up, like at some point, like you can't... You, whatever anyway yes so the price of food has gone up many more people are unemployed mm -hmm. um i think food is, is scarce for many people I, we don't live in a food desert by any means right there's food and vegetable in every corner in new york city thank god we have to yeah. make better choices about the way that we eat but the good you know there's a decent diet awaits us um but yeah our, our children are hungry and um they're also malnourished, many of them, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not only that they need to eat, it's they also need to eat better than they're eating. One of the things that, you know, should have been uh, a result of this pandemic, when, when we kept hearing people say um, that people were dying from um, underlying issues, right? Mm -hmm. Pre-existing conditions. Those are conditions that people would say the black community kind of, has the corner on. They are all preventable illnesses. And so while we were hearing the sirens and doing the death count every day, we also should have been talking about, and we, we need to do it. We need to talk about diet and exercise and changing the way that we eat and drink and sleep and ex you know all of it and take care of ourselves. And mm. we have to start that with our children. Yeah. We must start doing that with our kids. Fixing it in an adult is next to impossible. Let me ask you this we question. Have like, to start I mean, our children better. Yeah, I know before when we met before that um I asked you a question like you only, for your place, you only take you don't take any city money. Can you tell people why you don't take any city 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 funding? Because people a lot of people don't understand like how, how nonprofits work. Sometimes we get it's called government contracts and stuff like that that we right. you know. Then we get private funding. Why? Why? What's the reason? Can you tell me why you don't take the city funding? Well, one is philosophical, and the other one is just practical. So, philosophically, I feel like I want to take care of my own people. I want to be able to say what they need, how they get it, who they get it from, right? Like, um, I I believe that um, interdependence. Is, I mean, some of this is also like religious conviction, right? Like, 
I don't want to be dependent on the government. I do believe that people are supposed to be interdependent. We are supposed to take care of one another. Um, and so I want the freedom to do it my way. Mm -hmm. I want the, I want the, um, I, I want my program to have the kind of integrity where we're able to say, and this is not a slight on anybody else who takes government money. This is just a personal decision, but I want us to be able to say that we took care of our own kids. Um, and if that means that we have a little less and I have to work a little harder and I have, you know, this, so be it. But I, I really appreciate the fact that we have been taking care of our own children for over 30 years now. Um, and then just in a practical sense, um, it's a lot of paperwork. It is, you know, you need a whole person or people or department to, to do contract management work. And um, I'm good at, at, at uh, raising private money. I have really no interest in doing the work of public money. I can't blame you because I got a lot of government contracts and they drive me crazy. <laughs> 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 that's the question. That's what y'all keep telling me. So. I can't I listen. Like, oh, listen, no, I can't. listen no. before government contracts, before government contracts, I had hair. Yeah. <laughs> they, 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 they don't let I you. Man. Keep the little bit I have. <laughs> Pastor, Pastor Kim, Rod asked an interesting question about, um, about children that are hungry. Um, expound a little bit about our father's kitchen. Let the people know what that is, what that program is during regular times outside of a pandemic. Okay, so um, you know, growing up um, poor and and being people of color and and like this community is black and Latino, so food is is everything. It is the center of everything that we do, and it is a big part of our identity, and it's part of how we comfort and come together. Um, how we comfort each other, how we come together, how we celebrate everything. So um, I wanted us to have, because the community was being gentrified, um, I wanted us to have a community dinner. I wanted it to be that, um, when I thought about the poor people in our community, I wanted it to be that big families that couldn't go out to eat, couldn't take three kids or four kids out to dinner, could could bring their kids here, sit at a table that had fresh flowers and tablecloth and, and a waiter or waitress come and serve them a three course meal that was nutritious and delicious, um, <laughs> not far from home in a church, in our sanctuary where the pastors, where the pastors come by and say hello and offer prayer if you need. But mostly I just wanted them to feel like they had a place they could come and relax and and have time with their family. And then I wanted people who were moving into the community to have a space where they could meet the people who've been here. I also wanted them to see who we are. I wanted a, a, an open door time where they were not just coming in on Sunday morning gawking, um, or if they would even come in, right? So I, I, I wanted a time where new members of our community could come in and see what we were doing. Um, and then finally, you know, I come from a family that where hospitality is very, very important. We had restaurants. I just felt like it was a way to use one of my skills and, you know, my knowledge. And I don't know, God just said, do it, bring them together. And so that's what we do. The first Wednesday of every month until the pandemic happened, we would bring in about 70 to 100 people. They would be fed. Every table has a waiter, somebody around who can pray with them. Um, it was never like, you know, you have to come to church or people are not going to come here. And, you know, it's not a bait and switch. It was dinner. We invited you to dinner and it was dinner. And we just went out in the community, 300 invitations and handed out 300 invitations and about a hundred people would come. So one out of three, that's an amazing, um, that says a lot about, uh, the people who are here doing outreach and how, um, and the reputation of our church, the trust that people in our community have what we do and the quality of of you know our food and our care and our service so what, what do you so what do you what do you see like one of the what do you see a school being that after since this pandemic and thing like maybe five years from now what do you see what do you see the future of and, and of east new york because like you just mentioned gentrification is happening i mean east new york i'm sorry east harlem gentrification is happening what do you see in harlem do you see our faces still being in that community five years from now 
Um, I'm not, I mean, so this particular community has so much public housing in it. We have the most public pro like pro housing projects per square foot or something like that. And in whatever radius, it's some high number of New York City. I can't repeat it exactly, but um, for a square foot, we have the most housing projects. And so those are not gonna get torn down in the next five years. Poor people are going to be here. What they did was they built in every empty lot and in every tenement that they could tear down and remodel and you know gut, they've done that. Um, and so we're gonna all have to figure out how to coexist. And I don't know, you know, I, I'm struggling. I think I think a lot of people are struggling. On one hand, it's like you're you know you're here and you're our neighbor, so you're welcome. Um, on another hand, the way people come is is a little bit problematic. They come and there's like the, the building across the street from our church. It has a a shuttle bus that takes them to 96th Street because you know God forbid you have to walk to the subway at 103rd Street. Um, right. You know, just things like that. Like you, you don't shop here. Your kids don't go to school here. You don't come to church here, but you take advantage of lower rents. You know, mm. um, so so those kinds of things. I pray that in time, um, if people are going to be here, that we are more of a community. Um, I pray that more people are not dislo uh, dislocated. And um, feeling like they 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 have to leave, um, priced out of everything. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't know. I'm 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 very concerned. Um, sometimes you know you let things collapse to a point where everybody just kind of abandons it, and then other people come in. And mm -hmm. I feel like with our school system, a lot of times I feel like that's what's happening. Um, if they can't take our housing. And they will just destroy the school system, and then we will have to flee for that reason, um, or the violence, or the something, right? But there's, it's it's hard to be here. You, you mentioned you mentioned earlier, uh, Pastor, that um, the more affluent schools were still sending their children to school. You know, they still the children were still attending classes, um, and that's not the case there. What is happening with? Um, with socialization, you know, there's a certain socialization that goes to school. What are you seeing with regard to our children there um, with regard to the lack of socialization that comes from them not being able to attend school and see their friends or go to their activities if they have any, or I don't, you know, I don't know what there is. Going well, on. I think for some of them there, um, there's too much of whatever negative stuff might be going on at home, right? There's just more of that. So if you're, whatever your problems are at home, whether there may be violence or um, mental illness or anxiety, you know, like, or drug addiction or whatever, or overcrowding, um, you know, there's more of that. And then you're living in close quarters with people 24 hours a day. And, you know, there's what that brings. Um, and then, you know, as young people, you're physical and you, right now our kids are sitting, we have like, you know, Right before this happened, what would we say? We would say preschoolers or little kids 30 minutes a week on, on, on screen time. Um, older kids 30 minutes a day, no more, right? And then all of a sudden this happens and suddenly it's fine and we're ignoring what the repercussions of this are, right? Before we, we had a long list of all the ways that screen time hurt children just 10 months ago. And all of a sudden, this is just the way we have to do it. There's another way to do it. You know, certain people know how to educate children. They happen to be in charge of our educational system. Their children don't go to our schools, though. So they, you know, there's one standard for one set of children, and then there's a whole different standard for ours. So our kids need what all children need. They need exercise. They need sunlight. They need interaction. They need positive reinforcement every day. They need the arts. They need science. They need labs. They need, you know, like the resources that are in school. Um, and they need friendship. Play is a child's work, right? That is their job. Their job is mm. to play. They were created that way. And so the fact that they are homebound is, you know, the, the repercussions, depending on how well the parents or guardians or whatever are able to manage that, it's, it's difficult. I have a 16-year-old at home 
this has not been good for him, for his mental health. And I talk to other young people and then try to manage it. Like, when do we let, you know, do I let you see your friends? Do they have to test before they come to our house? Do I let you have a sleepover? Do we, we go on vacation? So get, let one of your friends test and come with us. Like, how do I keep you safe? keep the rest of us safe, but allow you to have some sense of normalcy in your life. You know, he told me the other day, I want to go back to like, I want guitar classes. I don't want them online. I want karate class. I don't want to do a karate class online. I, you know, like he's sick of this already. Mm -hmm. How is he supposed to go through the normal things of being 16 and 17, all those little milestones, stones, good and bad stuff that he should yeah. be doing right now. He's not doing any of it. That I know. Of. Oh well, Pat, that's the case. So first of all, you know, our kids are in a terrible position. Thank, thank you so much for for joining us and sharing that tonight. Before we go, I just want you to tell the people um, where the church is located and how they can find you online, your social media, and how they can uh, watch services on Sunday until we open up. And can they make it rain at the church? So, we need donations. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> we, made, we made it. Oh wait, we almost got through. Yeah, oh, we almost yeah, got through. We, 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 we was close. I said, "Well behaved tonight." It was there. Yeah. I was thinking too. We sound so we sound so intelligent right yeah, now. Yeah, man. yeah. 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 You know, first of all, Pastor Kim, this is my opportunity to say we will never get anywhere. <laughs> we will never get anywhere as a people. I have to say that, but but go ahead, tell the people how we can how yes, we can find you. Will. Know how to ballet and boogaloo. It's fine. That'll make us any less thank you, intelligent. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. Um, so we are the Church of the Resurrection. We're at 325 East 101st Street. 325 East 101st Street, and that is in New York City, 10029. If you want to send something in the mail, um, or if you want to stop by uh, Resurrection Sunday, we are opening, opening, opening. We are reopening. Um, 11 o'clock Sunday mornings. Um, with all safety protocols in place. Um, we are on Facebook, the Booker T. Washington Learning Center, the Booker T. Washington Learning Center on Facebook. We're also the Church of the Resurrection NYC, Resurrection NYC on Facebook. And you'll see, you know, you'll know it's us. You'll see plenty of pictures of me and other people. Um, so, it, I mean, it'd be great to have interaction, to have people follow us and see what we're doing. We are also the BTW Preschool on Instagram. Um, our little ones are on Instagram. It's easier for their parents to follow with photos. So BTW Preschool um, on Instagram. So please follow us, support, show you love. And you guys, let me just say, I have been listening to y'all. This is wonderful. <laughs> Oh, thank, oh you, thank you, thank you, thank I you. Thank you. This gonna is get us. so good. I thought you, I thought you were going to say something bad. About yeah, it. I thought she was going to get us. That's what I thought she was going to do. She was going to say, I heard some of the stuff y'all be saying. <laughs> oh, let me tell you. No, no, I hear what I have heard it, and I love it. I love it. Okay. It's exactly what we need. We need to hear black men's voices. We don't. We're not allowed in the barbershop all the time. I walk into a barbershop, it gets quiet. I got to stand <laughs> around for like twenty minutes before they, you know. <laughs> Take it up again. <laughs> so it's wonderful to hear y'all chop it up. Uh, it really thank you. Thank, you. thank you very much. The voices, the way you think. Not enough of us are listening to y'all. So thank you so much for creating this platform. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank Love you. you. Let's have a great day. All right. Love you. Love y'all. Love you too. Take care. Take it easy. Peace. All righty. All right. Yeah. Uh oh, there we go, man. Derek, you're blowing up. up. You're getting a raise. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, I tell you one thing about um, Reverend Wright that I agree with. She said that the children need to get out and play. That's what they were born to do. That's probably what's wrong with me. I need to get out and play. I, I do too. I'm going crazy. Know, I'm, yeah, I'm going crazy. I need to get out and play. Mm -hmm. Not like I used to do a long time ago. I'm talking about like just travel, get out, be comfortable going to dinner, doing the yeah. normal things that I'm used to do. I need to get out and play. She's right. We're, we're close. We're close, fellas. We're, yeah. we're close. Yeah. We're, we're on the last stretch of this, I think. I actually yeah. want to play, play a game of tag. I do want to play like red light. <laughs> I want to play red light, green light, one, two, three. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I want to get out and play a game of Skelly. On the, Skelly. The people, oh, man. That's a New York, that's a New York game. But no, no yeah. I'm going to tell you a secret, y'all. I know how to turn double Dutch very well. 
Okay. You do okay, it. You're D, not, D, you're D, not hold on. Let's you in. Look, the turn of yours, let you Wait, D, we're going to have a, a meeting. First, getting the, the chest wax. Okay. <laughs> it's getting your idea. Now don't show it. Don't show so it. We're going to have, we're gonna have, we're gonna have He's to have very meeting. comfortable. And then they got this new <laughs> yeah, game yeah. out. Uh, it's like a, a treasure chest game where you find the Red Bull machine that's missing. <laughs> that's the new thing they got now. You know, <laughs> it depends. It depends on the time frame, Kelvin. That that Red Bull Bull machine might be stripped now. The time, yeah. the, time is the, last right. the, the bull is gone. Yeah, the bull is gone. Yeah, everything's gone oh, on that machine now. No, listen, listen, going I, I'm, I'm nice with numbers too. That's another thing. But I ain't gonna, that's a whole nother subject with that one, man. I'm nice with that. It's a challenge. Little girls in the school when, when I was working elementary school. They didn't know Mr. D was nice with these. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, before yeah. we go, like, you know, we always tell people certain things to watch and stuff like this. So this is um this is a watch it and chop it segment of the show. What do you guys have on your watch it and chop it list? What's number one for y'all? Um, I think um trial four for me. Okay. Um, it's a documentary on Netflix. It was, I think it goes back to 1993. Basically, um, a young young brother was accused of killing a Boston police officer. And um, I don't want to tell the ending, but um, basically he went on four trials before he came back with a final decision. I think it's a must watch. Um, it definitely gives you an insight into how the police department works and how it protects itself by any means necessary. Yep, I watched it. That was very good. Um, yeah. I got on my, on my list, I got a Judas and the Black Messiah. Okay, right. okay. That was that was that was good. Um, I would just say the only thing, only my only problem with that was, I wish they would show Fred Hammond what made him get become a Panther before and made it a three hour movie instead of an hour and a half movie. Yeah, yeah I think they needed more time for that movie. They needed more. They needed, they needed more time for the movie, and I think you know some of the stuff we all knew, some of the things, but I know some of us didn't know about. I, I'm not gonna spoil it because some people might not even see it, but I don't know, know the Fred Hammond story. Story, but it's a must watch for me. It's a it's a must watch. Watch it. I, I say it's a watch too for me too. Yeah, I got snowfall on mine right now. You know, get oh. back into the new, to the new uh, season. Those first Best two episodes, woo! Out, man, right now. Bye. Snowfall. For that's people that don't know, it's on FX. You can watch yeah. it on. Uh, it's also on Hulu. But that's yeah. that's that's a, that's a must watch right there. And oh, people, yeah, yeah. people don't understand it's like loosely based about. Um, Freeway Ricky Ross's lifestyle. Yeah, it ain't about throwing snowballs, everybody. Nah, <laughs> at all, at all, at it ain't all. about throwing snowballs. Yeah, it, gives, yeah. it, gives you, it gives you insight of how the uh, CIA uh, and uh, Iran with uh, the Contras. Uh, yeah, the Contras. Contras, yeah. Contras yeah. With, with Ronald, Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan. Uh, first, first bitch, Bush. I mean, Bush. I ain't say bitch. I mean, Bush. <laughs> <laughs> what, what he had to play in that. Like that you, know? <laughs> you know, you know, snowfalls is a must. Um, and another one is, uh, I would say, is is a uh, hip hop uncovered that just wrapped yes. up the la- six episodes. Uh, last ep- uh, last two episodes was last night. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, you know, we all probably came up in that era when hip hop and how yes. it changed from into the to the street got involved in it. So if anybody wants yeah. to say anything about that, but I think it's a must watch. You and I am, I am right now, as you guys know, I'm not in my house yet. Um, so I've been, you know, I'm on the second season of Good Times, and um, <laughs> I'm, binge, I'm, I'm binge watching Good Times right now, and everything like that. So I just, I, I don't know what's gonna happen. I just, I, I just hope James in Florida live happily ever after. So that's what right now. Don't spoil it, but that's where I'm at right now. You know? Yo, I, I hate to, I hate to spoil it to you. Um, I hate oh. to spoil it for you, Kelvin, but the. Uh, on the last episode, they move on up to the, and they, turn, they, live, they, they live next to the Jefferson. So that's the spoiler. So the Remember, Times move next to the Jefferson. Yeah, what was the guy named Three football? words. He was trying to get played football. He was trying to football. The guy. What was the name? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. See, that's how they, that's how they got it. They got yeah, he, they got out of it. Selma, yeah. Selma's still single right now. I, yeah. I yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember, three words. Oh, damn, 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 damn. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Another show that uh, came on, I think this might be. The third season? I'm not sure. It's for uh, it's called for life. It might be the second or third. I'm not sure. It's, it's, uh, it's second, I think it is. Second, second season, yeah, and it's yeah. produced by um, executive produced by uh, Fifty Cent. Okay. Um, it's about the bro- this brother that was wrongly, uh, falsely accused of, uh, yeah. out by the New Jersey Police Department, but they base it now like it's in New York. He became a lawyer while incarcerated, incarcerated in jail, beat his own case, and now he's defending former he's defended former criminals and also people that's going on the street. And it kind of ties into what's going on now. I don't want to spoil it for you, but I think it's a must-watch for everybody. It's a yeah. great, great. And, 
My right. wife and, the, and the person the story is about is is um saying they're going to run for mayor for New York too. That's right. Oh, is, is, is he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, with that like, said, with that said, brothers, man, man, I love you guys, man. Always. And uh, let's chop it up love. next week, Thanks, man. man. I hope to see y'all this love. week. Anybody free this week? I'm I'm willing to hang out. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, right brothers. on where you depends on when you want to hang. Hey, listen, man. I'm, I'm thinking about going to the gentleman's club of leisure. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. We're gonna leave that one at that. Uh, uh. All right. All right, brothers. Peace, Jamie. Take us out, man. Take care.